everyone, Judicial Watch President Tom Fitton here with our weekly update on social media. Thank you as always for joining us. Uh, so much going on here in Washington, so much going on here in Washington, D.C., uh, but uh, we're facing, you know, another uh, attack on a Republican form of government up in New York next week with the trial of President Trump on sham charges in New York City. I will talk about that. Uh, we have a big battle with the CIA over their communications with a Clinton campaign lawyer. You know, everyone else pretends that that corruption, oh yeah, that's yesterday's news. It isn't yesterday's news. It's related to the ongoing fights about FISA and domestic spying by the deep state and things like that, and I'll talk about that, and you, you're just gonna get outraged about the CIA stonewalling of Judicial Watch's FOIA requests about this basic information. Uh, plus, we've got some of the most disturbing records I've seen in some time from the FBI, speaking of um, domestic surveillance. It's F the FBI's illicit targeting of after she died. Just, cr just criminally, criminally outrageous activity as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so uh, to begin at the beginning, we have on April 15th, the scheduled start of a trial, a criminal trial of uh, former President Donald J. Trump in New York City. Uh, he is being prosecuted by Democratic politician, Soros-backed prosecutor, a big funder of Sor Soros, I think, gave him, as best I recall, upwards of 20% of his campaign funds. So he's a, he's a progressive Democrat who for years kind of resisted targeting Trump on sham charges, and then, uh, then he got a lot of pressure, and he filed an outrageous indictment, uh, or pursued an outrageous indictment against President Trump over hush money payments, supposedly. And what had happened was um, uh, Trump uh, was dealing with this woman, Stormy Daniels, who reportedly was talking about his, his or her relationship with him, and uh, they came to a confidentiality agreement. And uh, reportedly, he, through his lawyer, uh, paid her some consideration. And the way the uh, New York Democrats up in the city there are pursuing this claim is they're suggesting that uh, despite the FEC looking at it and finding nothing inappropriate, the Federal Elections Commission, despite the uh, Justice Department, the anti-Trump Justice Department looking at it and finding nothing, they decided to find something. So they're making up uh, fake misdemeanor charges against him that he uh, delineated the payments wrong in his business records, and that's a misdemeanor and they're trying to attach to that misdemeanor federal election charges, that because he was uh, making payments that have impacted the campaign uh, and they weren't reported properly, there are federal charges associated with it, and it turns it into a felony at the state level. Now, if you're confused by that, you should be, because normally states don't enforce federal law. And of course, the interpretation of federal law is baloney. So under his theory, Politicians can go around at the federal level and raise money to uh, engage in confidentiality agreements with folks making accusations against them. And in essence, you can raise money to do whatever you want as long as you report it. And of course, that's not what the law is. It's not a campaign expenditure. And even if it were, it's not the sort of expenditure that's enforceable or can be uh, prosecuted in, in state court because it's a federal campaign. So pretty simple analysis. Most honest observers, even the anti-Trump leftists uh, who want to see him in jail, uh, see this as a weak case. You know, but the danger is uh, it's a weak case, but it's a weak case in a city that is mostly Democrat, largely Democrat, it's being prosecuted by a Democratic prosecutor who's put politics before the rule of law. Um, the Democrat judge who is uh, pursuing this case is also a Democrat. She, he's a donor to the Biden campaign. He's donated to other left-wing causes. His daughter is um, an activist uh, who is employed by Democratic operations and campaigns 
including those who benefit and raise money, in part based on this very prosecution. So the judge should be recused, but he's refused to. He doesn't want to even police the, court, the, the, police the prosecution in any, any serious way. He's been ruling against Trump on matters great and small, uh, further demonstrating his bias, in my view. So I don't know what's going to happen with this trial. Is, it, is, is Trump going to kind of figure out, is it, are his attorneys going to get through this and, and actually win the case and get him exonerated or acquitted or maybe just found guilty on misdemeanor charges, which would largely be irrelevant to his presidential campaign? But I can tell you, if he's found guilty of a felony, it's not out of the realm of possibility, although the likelihood isn't great, but it's still significant that he would be sentenced to jail. And when would he serve that jail sentence, if at ever? I don't know. Before the election, I don't know. But that's the plan of the left. There's this desperate effort to jail him prior to the election, get him convicted, obviously, of a felony, while President Biden gets a free pass on all of his criminality, serious criminality. So Trump did nothing wrong, and they're putting him in jail. There's tons of evidence of criminality, RICO, mafia-like activity by the President of the United States, Joe Biden, and he's getting a free pass. And it's even freer than you may know, because I can tell you uh, the Republicans are running away from impeachment. I've been, I've been kind of ticked about it this week. I, I did um, a video um, highlighting what I've been um, finding here in town on the Biden impeachment effort by Republicans on the House. Let's run that video. Hey everyone, it looks like the Republicans in the House are about to abandon the impeachment of President Biden. Uh, they don't have the votes. They're, the leadership hasn't been pushing for the votes. And certainly House leadership hasn't been educating Americans about the urgent need to impeach President Biden over some of the worst corruption we've ever seen uh, by a sitting president. Uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this development comes as President Trump faces uh, a show trial on fake criminal charges by the Democratic machine up in New York. Uh, a trial commenced, you can be sure, at the behest of the Biden gang. And as that's happening, Joe Biden's getting a free pass from the House Republicans. Really unacceptable. We need the leadership. And of course, voters can still have a say here. So share your views by calling the House at 202-225-3121. That's 202-225-3121. Now, of course, you know, if you ask Jim Jordan or probably Congressman Comer or the Speaker or other House leaders, they say, oh, no, impeachment's continuing. You know, Tom, don't worry about it. We're still pursuing impeachment. But look, I've, I've been in town in Washington, D.C. longer than I care to admit to. I've seen the stories that have been leaked out there that they don't have the votes for impeachment. Uh, they may consider just a referral for criminal activity to the Biden Justice Department. And uh, I've asked repeatedly, haven't gotten an answer. I've asked very well-connected people, people who are in the position to know what's happening with impeachment, when's it going to happen, what's with these stories, suggesting you're running away, and I haven't gotten a straight answer. So I know what's happening, and I can tell you what's happening. The Republicans, if they had their way, would skip a vote at the, uh, on the impeachment of Joe Biden. That's what the plan is. I think that's what they're hoping they're able to get away with. Just let it die on the vine. Now, in the meantime, there may be impeachment activity, continued investigations, maybe even some litigation from the House to get information. They're get, getting stonewalled, but the, it's been mighty slow in terms of uh, breaking through those stone walls. But I'm not convinced at all, and I have good reason to believe that uh, they're going to shelve the impeachment of Joe Biden this year. In the meantime, there's this impeachment of Maya Orcus, who was already um, impeached by the House. And again, to remind you, those of you who don't follow impeachment, those of you normal folks who don't necessarily know what the impeachment process is under our Constitution, let me remind you, the House impeaches someone, um, uh, you know, a, 
um, the targeted official, in the case of uh, Meyer Orcus, the Homeland Security uh, Secretary, who uh, essentially has enabled an invasion of the United States, he's been impeached for that. And then it's up to the Senate to conduct a trial, if they so choose, I would argue, and then remove him or acquit him or otherwise sanction him. Now, the Senate doesn't even want to do a trial on Meyer Orcus, so I'm not even sure what's going to happen there. And now the Republicans, it doesn't look like, are planning a vote and or are planning to lose a vote on Biden's impeachment. And, uh, you know, I understand that the Republicans have a close run thing there in the House with the majority being, I think, effectively a two seat majority. So, I mean, maybe two, I think it's one of the most narrow majorities in modern history. So I think they can afford to lose two votes and then they lose control of the House or, you know, they can, anything they want is knocked out. And, um, but how do you overcome, you know, what is it you do to kind of generate support for impeachment even in a closely, uh, you know, even in a House where you have a small majority? You provide leadership. You put pressure on your members, say this is important, and of course you educate the public as to why the impeachment of Biden is urgent and necessary. And I haven't seen much in the way of any of that recently uh, from House leadership. And that tells me their heart isn't in it, as I suggested. So if you're interested on the, in the impeachment issue of Joe Biden, you should call your House members, your members of Congress, as I said earlier, at 202-225-3121, 225-3121. And you can ask for the speaker's office. You can call the speaker's office as well. Um, you can ask for, you, you call that number. Uh, I haven't called it in a bit, so I'm not quite sure how the operators, it may be semi-automated semi, -auto, it may be semi -automated now. Uh, so you ask for your house member. Uh, you can also ask for the speaker's office and communicate politely and firmly your views on the impeachment of Joe Biden. Trump could be going to jail while at the same time, of course, Biden is essentially given, given a free pass by the one entity that can actually hold him accountable, however mildly, the House of Representatives, which is nominally controlled by Republicans. And I hate to remind you, but I will, those abuses you see up against New York, uh, up against Trump in New York by Alvin Bragg, Letitia James, those abuses you see down in uh, Fulton County, Georgia by Fannie Willis, those abuses you see by Jack Smith against President Trump, all fully funded by the House and Republicans in the Senate. Republican-controlled House, most Republicans in the Senate. I mean, I saw the other day they had Director Ray, the FBI director, in for um, questioning before the House. And, you know, one of the uh, uh, descriptions of the testimony was, you know, is he going to be grilled by Republicans? You know, get grilled by Republicans for what? All the misconduct and abuse they just fully funded two weeks, ahead, two weeks ago? Spare me. Spare me. So that's where we are. Election interference up in New York. They're trying to rig an election by jailing Trump on specious charges. And meanwhile, those who can do better aren't doing it and giving Biden a free pass on his unprecedented corruption. So pray for the country, pray for our republic, because governments who jail leading presidential candidates, national people vying for national leadership, those are the sorts of governments that are antithetical to a constitutional republic. And that's where we are. And anyone who pretends there's normalcy these days, it isn't. And I would submit, I've said it, I've heard before, that the presidential election has already been compromised by this corruption. The pre President Trump has had to spend money he otherwise could have applied to the campaign. He's been otherwise focused on 
these criminal cases that where he otherwise could have been focused on the campaign, it's already compromised the process. So now Judicial Watch will continue its FOIA litigation and telling the truth about what's going on with this corruption, pressing for more information from the deep state and the Democratic Party operatives trying to upend our constitutional republic. But other people in positions of responsibility and who have the capacity also to do the good work to hold government accountable and police misconduct, they also need to step up. So just because Judicial Watch is doing the heavy lifting, it doesn't mean that Congress gets a pass. Because if it's, it's important that our country be protected from this abuse, because frankly, the republic is on the line, as far as I'm concerned. You know, before I get into the substance of, of the report, you know, I, I do want to highlight something else, because I think it kind of, it's kind of another marker of the insanity and destructive policies and way of thinking the left is kind of uh, undermining America with. Uh, O.J. Simpson, the double murderer, killed Ron Goldman and his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson. Those two poor people stabbed to death by O.J. Simpson. And because of racialism, he wasn't uh, convicted. He was, he was ex acquitted of those two murders. And he just died this week of, of uh, cancer. And, um, you know, frankly, as far as I'm concerned, he should have died long ago. If our justice system was working, he would have been executed. And, you know, here we have, you know, the left and the left media kind of bending over backwards to excuse and place in context the miscarriage of justice that still really has impacted this country 20, 30 years later. And of course, the left playing the race card. And here's a clip from some extreme leftists on, on uh, CNN that gives you a feel for what's happening. He represented something for the black community in that moment, in that trial, particularly because there were two white people who had been killed. And the, the history around how black people have been persecuted um, during slavery, there were, there were just so many layers. So many layers. And, you know, this is my tweet in response to garbage like that. The left media's Marxist racialist analysis and excuses for O.J. Simpson's double murder of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman should tell you all you need to know about the threat the extremist left pose to your very lives and the rule of law. And, you know, I know that we've talked about Floyd Brown and how that was an incentive or a, a pretext for the left to destroy our criminal justice system or undermine it in a way that's gotten countless Americans killed and harmed, but OJ was a big turning point as well. And, you know, and things aren't getting better. You know, where their crime may go down because their public reaction to high crime rates, but there's still this insanity. And, and I'm gonna play a video, and I'm not playing it to kind of joke about this person's physical appearance and to mock him. I'm playing it to highlight the state of our criminal justice system and how leftist extremism, in this case transgender extremism, is kind of distorting it and making a mockery of it, in addition to frankly making a mockery of women. And so uh, on, on, on Instagram, I saw this video, or it's been, it's been around all over on Twitter and stuff, and I posted just a reaction on Instagram. You you may you may have to sit down for this one. Go ahead. Okay, let me check on that. Yeah, yeah. So we were talking in A6, 845? Yeah. That yeah. works for me. All right. Do I need to sign anything? No. Nope. Just out of here. <laughs> my comment about my client? Yeah. I just met her. She's really nice. She's really smart. She sounds like she's got the right idea about things. I really support what she's up to, and I think it's fabulous. How about that? God, it, do you, she's accused of, what is it, criminal trespass? In the first degree. 
Yes. Is she innocent or guilty? She's innocent, of course. She's innocent, okay. Well, she's caught on video being arrested and protesting and allegedly protesting. Uh -huh. So I'm trying to get all sides. So well, my client has pled not guilty. My name is Stephanie Mueller. I'm in the uh, directory for the Washington State Bar Association. You can look me up. Okay. So this is the left's approach to the criminal justice system. I mean, your reactions, I'm sure, are much going to be a little bit more vociferous than mine will be, which I'll try to be polite on air. But this is the insanity we're facing in our criminal justice system. And, uh, you know, OJ was a symptom of it. That video is a symptom of it. The abuse of Trump is a symptom of it. The anarchy in many of our nation's big cities are a symptom of it. And it's a kind of a dramatic illustration on how this radical left-wing ideology is used to, uh, how, how it intersects, right, with our public safety issues that we're so concerned about, criminality. You know, as I recall, that, that lawyer was representing a radical leftist who disrupted some type of proceeding and was arrested. Boy, oh boy. So I'll give you a chance to finish washing your eyes out, and we'll go into our <laughs> next topic here. Um, so we're, I saw Hillary in the news the other day. She's out there running. I don't know if she's not running for anything, but she's clearly interested in still influencing politics. She's been on TV. I had an Instagram video the other day watching her talk about the election. I don't remember. I don't know. Did we pull that up, guys? I don't remember. No. Um, so anyway, she's out there, and she was at the state dinner at the White House the other day with her husband, Bill Clinton, for the Prime Minister of Japan. And I noted online that, um, you know, the disgraced politicians, Bill and Hillary Clinton, Bill who was impeached, disbarred, and barely escaped prosecution, Hillary similarly, similarly escaped prosecution twice, protected by the deep state and um, were, as I call it, the loser Republicans who are afraid to uh, pursue justice against Hillary. And of course, they're happily over at the Biden White House, kind of a dramatic illustration of just um, how it shows that crime pays for the elitist left in this country. And, uh, but, you know, Judicial Watch isn't giving up on the corruption targeting Trump pursued by Clinton. You know, when we talk about the spying against Trump, when we talk about the spying against the Trump campaign, that was in league with the, the, the FBI working hand in glove with the Clinton campaign. And then even after he was elected, you had Clinton operatives, her campaign lawyer, communicating with the FBI and CIA, trying to get them successfully, in some measure, to go after Trump. And one of those lawyers was prosecuted. The Clinton campaign lawyer, lawyer Mr. Sussman, you may recall, was unsuccessfully prosecuted by special counsel Don, John Durham for making, false, for making a false statement to a federal agent about who he was representing when he went and tried to get the count, general counsel for the FBI to investigate uh, Donald Trump's um, computers because they were, you know, they had concocted this idea that the Russians were somehow involved with his computers. Just like really crazy conspiratorial stuff. Obviously false. But in Sussman's trial, and in the Durham report, it came out that the FBI, the CIA had talked to the Clinton campaign lawyer. And we sued for those records back in 2021, or 2022, excuse me. Our, our request was back in 2021. And we had a court hearing on it. Because the, just, the CIA is just playing games with us in terms of responding to our request for this basic information. Who, what was going on in the CIA with respect to this Clinton operative? 
During the hearing, well, this court hearing we had before, I think it was before Judge Walton, who's a federal judge here in the District of Columbia, Judicial Watch explained that the case was filed more than two years ago and that it took the CIA more than a year until July 1st, 2023, to provide four responsive records introduced into evidence at Sussman's spring 2022 criminal trial. So these were essentially government do public documents. And uh, even then, they had these ridiculous redactions. Let me see if I can find them for you. Yeah, redactions of what they were told by this private person, this lawyer. Here, let me show it to you. So these are what the redactions look like. Some, some agencies uh, use white rather than black. They've gotten figured out that it doesn't look good to have black redactions. This is, this is not CIA material. This is Clinton campaign material or Clinton campaign lawyer material. I guess there's a debate about who he was representing, the Clinton campaign or the tech people who are working essentially with and for the Clinton campaign. So we've been involved in this case for years just to get this basic information. And our top lawyer, Paul Orfanides, who directs our litigation team, he was in court this week with Judge Walton. And he really filed, he filed an excellent brief, um, I guess it was last year. But they've been stalling. And, you know, I kind of want to go through this with you because we're taking on the darn CIA to figure out if they were trying to interfere in our, uh, no, not interfere in the election. I think it was this post-election, what was this meeting? Yeah, it was during the, Clinton, uh, the Trump administration. The CIA is meeting with folks trying to get the CIA to spy on and target Trump. It's called sedition, right? Is that insurrection? So uh, forgive me for thinking it's still important. We're talking about domestic spying a lot this week with FISA. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And we're all supposed to yawn that the CIA is coordinating with Clinton operatives to try to target the sitting president at the time. No wonder no one trusts them. You know, and Paul in the brief highlights how these redactions, these blackouts are so outrageous. And I encourage you to read the brief. It's, it's linked in our press release. You can probably link it directly below. The memorandum is uh, Chatterson's work product, which Chatterson was an outsider who was setting up this meeting, not the CIA's work product. You know, it's the CIA's work product. Sometimes they can hide that from you for obvious reasons. The CIA's invocation of Exemption 1 over substantial portions of this memorandum fails to explain how disclosure of a record prepared by a private individual about a conversation with another private individual could properly be classified or otherwise said to contain information about intelligence activities uh, and intelligence methods. So Exemption 1 is the exemption under FOIA that agencies can used to, uh, they cite, in order to justify the withholding of classified material generally. Nor does the defendant explain how or even why the two private entity parties to the conversation would be discussing or even know about the defendant's then current methods of communication or intelligence gathering capabilities or the travel destinations of the CIA's off the CIA officer or areas of interest of for intelligence collection. So, I mean, we do this basic FOIA request, and the next thing you know, we're arguing national security issues with the CIA that they're trying to apply, make classified communications from Hillary operatives to them. That's where we are right now. And then there's this other weirdness where the CIA is refusing to give us a list of documents they might have or, but are withholding, or even the number of documents that are at issue here. No list, no numbers, they're calling it. And that's very unusual in the FOIA context. We, I don't think I've ever run against, I, certainly I don't recall it ever happening in a Judicial Watch FOIA case before. 
We've had what they have uh, called Glomar exceptions. You can look up the Glomar case for more information about that. It's a very interesting uh, story. But the Glomar exception is we can't confirm or deny whether documents exist. And sometimes that's allowed, especially in the intelligence context, right? Now, think about why it might. I'll give you a second to think about it. Why might it be appropriate for an intelligence agency to say, we can't tell you if the documents exist or not? Because in some cases, you may have intelligence activities you don't want to confirm or deny to keep the bad guys and the targets of intelligence gathering um, you know, in the dark about it. In this case, they haven't gone that far, but they're suggesting those are kind of similar issues involved in not giving us the number of documents they have or providing us a Vaughn index. A Vaughn index is an index of documents which the uh, uh, agencies in FOIA cases, uh, well, I don't know if it's only FOIA cases, but it's, it's where I've run into it. In FOIA cases, uh, supply to the court and to the party suing, where they disclose the records, they give some description of the records and the reasons and the justifications for the withholding. So they're kind of like Excel spreadsheets, more or less, right? They don't want to provide that here. So this is the interesting case about, so I want to talk about that. No number, no list. Plaintiff recognizes that the missing records identified may be among the responsive records subject to defendants no number, no list response. I guess there were some missing records that were referenced. Yeah, these missing records were records that were in the trial that are, were already known to be in the CIA's possession, it looks like. Little precedent exists regarding no number, no list responses. Most significantly, the court in a prior case concerning the ACLU in another FOIA matter, expressed substantial caution about their use. No number, no list response might, might be viewed as a kind of Vaughn index, as I was describing earlier, albeit a radically minimalist one. Such a response would only be justified in unusual circumstances and only by a per particularly persuasive affidavit, usually from an agency official, who explains to the judge why they can't provide the information, in theory because of national security grounds. The court continued in this ACLU case, once an agency acknowledges that it has some responsive documents, there are a variety of forms that subsequent filings in the district court may take. A pure no number, no res list response is one end of the continuum, a traditional Vaughn index is at the other. Not quite a min as minimalist as a pure no number, no list response might be a no number, no list response with respect to a limited category of documents coupled with a Vaughn index for the remainder. So you could have a mix. So, you know, you may be kind of getting a little confused here. But I, re I, I raise this issue with you to highlight how the CIA, CIA is playing games with us. So it's, this is essentially an admission that there are a bunch of documents, but they're telling the court they don't want to tell us how many documents there are, even though there's a category of records that have been disclosed through this court process already, a criminal case, where the CIA was involved in dealing with this Clinton operative. And this is the conclusion from Paul's brief. The CIA's response to our request was woefully inadequate. The defendant admits it do not, it, I gotta go up here, it's easier for me to read. The CIA, I, I call it, it's the defendant, but the CIA admits it did not even search for records responsive to the request, but instead relied on an earlier search based on undisclosed parameters and produced only a handful of redacted exhibits introduced into evidence by the government at Sussman's criminal trial. Its no number, no list response ignores the substantial information already made public at the criminal trial and in the Durham report, and it is not supported by defendant's conclusory declaration. Defendant's redactions to the Chattison memo are neither logical nor plausible nor supported by defendant's declaration, especially because the memorandum memorializes a meeting between two private individuals. Defendant's motion for summary judgment, that's a motion basically to throw out our case, 
should be denied and our cross motion should be granted. So we're seeking a cross motion that their case should be thrown out. We should get the documents. Defendants should be ordered to conduct a proper search provide a Vaughn index of any additional responsive records located during that search, and produce an unredacted version of the Chattison Memorandum consistent with plaintiff's arguments herein. So it tells you a little bit about the work we're doing here. I kind of, I, I normally don't get into that level of detail about our FOIA cases, but I think it's worth highlighting. And again, to give you more context here from Paul's brief, this is from the Durham report. Two CIA employees, CIA employee two and CIA employee one, prepared a memorandum summarizing the meeting they had with Sussman in February of 2017. The final version included Sussman's representation that he was not representing any particular client. Remember, that was a big issue. He was prosecuted because he told the FBI, oh, I'm just here as a citizen. There's no, but in fact, the F, uh, Durham alleged he was there for Hillary. In their interviews with the office, both CIA employees specifically recalled Sussman say, stating he was not representing a particular client. Indeed, the email suggests that as well. During the meeting, Sussman provided two thumb drives and four paper documents that, according to Sussman, supported the allegation. Allegations. The CIA analyzed the allegations and data that Sussman provided and provided a report to reflect its findings. So they were investigating by Trump. CIA was investigating Trump at the request of this Clinton lawyer. The report, Trump, by the way, was president at the time. The report explained that the analysis was done to examine whether the material provided demonstrated technical plausibility of the following. Do linkages exist to any Russian foreign intelligence service? Do linkages exist to Alpha Bank, which is a Russian bank? Or are the provided documents data based upon open source tools, activities, and is, and is the provided information technically conceivable? The CIA ultimately concluded that the materials that Sussman provided were neither technical plausible, technically plausible, nor did they withstand technical scrutiny, and further that none of the materials showed any linkage between the Trump campaign or Trump organization and any Russian foreign intelligence service or Alpha Bank. The report also noted that one of the thumb drives contained hidden data, which included Tech Company 2, Executive One's name, and email address, so they knew a little bit more about who had provided it. So that is the issue here, the CIA was investigating Trump, spying on him, right, at the behest of Hillary Inc. So they didn't really want to search for records. We forced them to search for records. They gave us documents that are obviously only part of the records. I mean, we talked about the thumb drives and the documents that were given to them. There's no records reflecting that were turned over to us or even listed in a, a log of documents they're not giving to us. And as I say, the CIA is in cover-up mode about its communications with the lawyer implicated in a shady spy operation against President Trump. What is the CIA hiding about its role in this plot against President Trump? We have a hearing scheduled again in May, so next month. So Judge Walton wants this case to proceed after two years, four documents, heavily redacted. This is the context for this whole FISA fight, right? What, what, who can we trust in the federal government when it comes to spying? Now, I kind of have, uh, so what had happened this week, if you're not following it, is there's been this big debate, and the House finally passed uh, this FISA reauthorization bill. And many conservatives and libertarian types and many Democrats 
don't like the uh, idea that there can be warrantless searches of American data in databases containing foreign intelligence surveillance material. So what happens is, and we're talking about a, a ginormous, I don't know if that's a word, how about an enormous, <laughs> unfathomable um, amount of data that our intelligence agencies collect um, in targeting overseas foreign targets, right? And some of that data captures uh, uh, communications about or with American citizens, and it's in the database. So if foreign terrorist X and nasty government foreign official Y are talking about a plot with American citizen Z, in theory, they can search this database about American citizen Z in the context of this foreign intelligence surveillance. Or if the activity of two foreign nationals or foreign nationals suggests that they're in contact with Americans, they can do a deeper dive into the file and find out who they are, and they get more information um, and target that American for further surveillance. So that was the debate. And the debate is uh, conservatives and others wanted a warrant requirement in order to look at Americans who were caught up in foreign intelligence surveillance. And remember, this is surveillance supposedly only done for the purposes of uh, the president's uh, you know, role as commander in chief uh, to surveil threats against the United States from abroad. And uh, you know, the whole FISA process is designed to constrain or kind of provide a process through which that, that occurs regularly and there's some accountability for that because previously there was no accountability. Presidents had presumptive constitutional authority to do everything we're talking about here without the courts checking him. I'm, ex I'm a, you know, kind of overstating it for effect there. So I'm of the belief that FISA is a sham and should be shut down and warrant requirements are unconstitutional impositions on the president's authority as commander in chief to protect the nation and spy on foreign nationals. And if you're talking to a foreign national or foreign nationals talking about you, that falls, in with the ambit, falls within the ambit of the president's of, uh, national defense authorities under the constitution. And he can try to figure out what's going on. Now the warrant requirement, and this is what I say here, the whole FISA reform debate is a sham. The best reform would be to prosecute Obama under the new rules they've come up with Trump, for Trump, because now you can be prosecuted for acts of crimes you allegedly commit as president, so, and the other abuses of FISA. But instead, we're gonna get full authorization for a process that has proven itself immune from accountability for even the worst possible abuse. And, you know, and that's why I say end it. And I think Trump agreed with me on that, too. And, uh, you know, Judicial Watch, has done historic work exposing the operations of FISA. Here's a, a tweet that highlights, and this was, I think, from what year, what was the date of this tweet, guys? I believe 2022. Yeah, I, th I don't think it was 2022. I think it was much certain, I think it was even earlier than that. I say, who needs an IG? And I guess they were talking about an IG investigation of the FISA. We exposed the dossier-based FISA court fraud targeting Trump. Uh, we got actually got the FISA warrants targeting Trump. First time in history they've been released. We got them through FOIA. We uncovered the FBI payments to Clinton spy Christopher Steele, who helped create that dossier, and how the FBI cut him off from payments, and then tried to rehire him, by the way. Extensive DOJ collusion through Bruce Orr, you may remember Bruce Orr, Collusion with Steele, Simpson. Glenn Simpson is the Fusion GPS guy. And this is the kicker. Look at that last one. No court hearings by the defrauded FISA courts. They had four applications from the federal government targeting a uh, president's campaign through Carter Page, and then the president himself through Carter Page after he became president, President Trump. 
and the court didn't have one hearing. Now, at that time, FISA warrant hearings were um, are one-sided, and they still are. The Foreign Intelligence Court is a secret court, and uh, it's essentially a paper. Uh, they basically push a lot of paper, it looks like. They don't hold enough hearings. But it would seem to me that if an agency is requesting four times to continue spying on essentially the president and all of his men through Carter Page, a federal court might ask for a little bit more detail. What are you getting or what have you gotten that requires further spying? Now, we already know there's been lies in those and misleading statements and material misleading statements in those FISA warrants to justify the harassment and targeting of Trump world. And the courts did nothing about it. The only person who was prosecuted was Ben Kleinsmith, who um, misled one of his colleagues about Carter Page and his relationship with the CIA. Kleinsmith uh, supposedly told his, uh, even though he knew better, that Page wasn't a CIA source and operative, you know, and a, a, a confidential human source when in fact he was, which would have made it much more difficult to get a FISA warrant on him because he's someone who already was in a position of trust with our intelligence committee, community. So my whole point here is all of that misconduct was illegal and could have been prosecuted and it wasn't. And they're telling us, well, we can pass FISA again. Warrants will, you know, further requirements for warrants will help more checks will help to stop the bad guys in the FBI from doing these abuses. And I don't buy it. And as I said, I've got these core constitutional concerns. The president's the one who's responsible. This whole FISA pro process dissipates the responsibility. No one's responsible. Oh, he did it. Oh, we got this report from so-and-so. Oh, the court should have caught it. The president, if FISA ended tomorrow, the president would still have authority to spy on foreign nationals and American citizens who were caught up with foreign nationals who were the target of those spying spies. Now, if he wanted to convict them, if there wanted to be prosecutions, there might be warrants that would be required. But that's not the issue here. So, you know, I know some people don't want to hear this, and a lot of my good friends disagree with me on this, but this whole FISA debate is a crock. And so FISA is likely to be reauthorized for two more years with some modest protections for privacy. There's probably not going to be an unconstitutional warrant requirement. And we're just going to have to trust Joe Biden not to abuse it and the people like Ray and Garland and people like that, the CIA who was working to spy on Trump not to abuse it. Do you trust them? I don't. Don't worry, there's a FISA process that will protect us. It hasn't protected us before because it's a government program. Just remember, FISA is a government program that doesn't address the fundamental issues that I'm talking about here. So forgive me for going on a little bit about FISA, but I have a particular view on it. We've done a lot of work on the issue, and uh, I think a lot of people are all wet about their analysis of it. They've got this horrible government program that isn't checking prior abuse, won't check current abuse largely, and it's some of the worst spying in American history targeting Trump. For all we know, it's continuing. But don't worry, FISA will be around for two more years and you'll be protected, right? So Judicial Watch does a lot of FOIA work, as you can tell. And uh, we have several FOIA cases, lawsuits, and investigations related to January 6th. Among the most important ones concern Ashley Babbitt, the 14-year Air Force veteran who was illicitly killed on January 6th in the U.S. Capitol by U.S. Capitol Hill Police Officer Lieutenant Michael Byrd. And Judicial Watch recently filed a $30 million wrongful death action against the federal government over that shooting death of Ashley, that wrongful death action that we filed. We filed it 
in the Southern District of California. I talked to you last week about how the Biden gang is trying to get the case moved here to Washington, D.C. because they think there'll be more friendly judges, or at least that's what we argue. But we also have these FOIA cases that we filed um, with various agencies about Ashley. And uh, we have a lawsuit, two lawsuits against the FBI. One we filed a year or two ago for FBI records about Ashley and her family also asked for records. So we filed a lawsuit for her family as well. And it turned up really awful documents about FBI misconduct and abuse. And the documents show that the FBI was investigating Ashley Babbitt for months, months after she was killed on January 6th. They were pursuing criminal allegations against a dead woman. Criminal allegations against a dead woman. Here are the documents. 50 pages or so. 62, technically. Began a few a week or two after the shooting death. I think we have some excerpts of, of the key FBI, one of the key FBI documents in this regard. Talking about her, look at this one. This is the classic. Babbitt was fatally shot, this is the leap one. Babbitt was fatally shot by police as she attempted to leap through the broken window of a door inside the Capitol. She wasn't leaping through the window. What, what, what's that craziness coming from? And then they list the crimes they're investigating this dead woman for. You don't prosecute dead people. What was the FBI doing other than abusing her memory, harassing her family and friends? Civil disorder, unlawful entry, riots, injuries to property, weapon, and violent entry disorderly conduct on Capitol grounds. And they used that to justify an investigation of her. In fact, they considered listing her as a terrorist, but at one point they said, um, put up the terrorist comment if you have it. Oh, well, there's one part where, a oh, watch list status. Babbitt is deceased, and therefore this case is not being nominated to the TSDB, the Terrorist Watch Database. You would think, oh, how brilliant FBI, she's dead, so maybe she's not a terrorist threat. Captioned investigation is being initiated based on photographic and video evidence that Ashley Elizabeth Babbitt unlawfully entered the United States Capitol building, a restricted building, on January 6, 2021, in violation of federal laws. Chief Division Counsel approval. Field Office Chief Division Counsel has reviewed and concurred with the opening so they had leadership within the FBI field office out there in California concurring with this. I mean, they did talk to one of her friends who had wonderful things to say about Ashley. It's amazing how this wasn't leaked to the media. All sorts of terrible things have been tar said about and, and uh, alleged about Ashley, but you know, the FBI knew better how she deployed several times throughout her service in the military, in Kyrgyzstan, in southern Iraq, the UAE. She's stationed in Alaska. She hurt herself in Alaska. And she was in Kuwait for a period of time. Her friend says that she was an outgoing, 
opinionated, loud, very intelligent, loyal, sweet, very loving and caring. At times, Babbitt was not a fan of her chain of command and made her views known. Babbitt was a leader rather than a follower and liked being her own boss. Consequently, she was happy running her pool company in California. Babbitt loved her family and loved her country. Her friend judged that she'd not likely know the risk of passing through the window. Babbitt would never go after someone physically, according to her friend. Why was the F, and this was an April interview, so they were interviewing people four months after she was killed by Lieutenant Byrd, who, by the way, was protected by these same feds. The federal government didn't do any serious investigation of him. Uh, the D.C. police didn't do a serious investigation. And, of course, he was never disciplined by the Congressional uh, Police Department, the U.S. Capitol Police, for which he worked. I mean, we found he was later put up for six months in a U.S. Air Force base, or I guess it's Joint Base Andrews down just south of Washington here, in a VIP suite, usually used for generals. He got to stay there for six months with his dog. Of course, they kept his name secret, gave him all sorts of special treatment that no other police officer involved in a shooting, especially the shooting of an unarmed individual during a protest. Compare and contrast the way he was treated with the way every other police officer in any shooting you recall over the last 10 years has been treated. Indeed, the last 20 years, 30 years. And they're investigating and harassing Ashley's friends? For what purpose? To justify her killing. That's the conclusion I draw, to justify her killing. So when people say, what do you think of the FBI? I say it's irredeemably corrupt. It can't be fixed. And we got to think of a different way to enforce our federal laws. You can read all of these documents on our internet site at judicialwatch.org, judicialwatch.org. Of course, we have links below as well. But our case will continue, our $30 million wrongful death action for Ashley Babbitt. Uh, we have these FOIA cases that will continue as well to try to get the full truth for her. And of course, we have a bunch more January 6 cases. I mean, we're still trying to get the videos. I guess the videos are going to be released, thanks in part to pressure from Judicial Watch. But there are still emails from January 6 that Congress is sitting on. We found that the CIA deployed operators, technicians, bomb technicians, and dog teams on January 6th. We just found that out. You didn't hear that from the media. You heard that from Judicial Watch. It was our heavy lifting that uncovered it. It is beyond belief that the Biden FBI gave Ashley Babbitt's killer a free pass while engaging in a malicious, months-long criminal investigation of Ashley herself. I think it's outrageous. What do you think? And I see a lot of outrageous stuff, but this one really, it takes the cake in some ways, doesn't it? So it shows you the government can abuse you even after you're dead. That's, that's how awful things are here in Washington, D.C. And all I can say, and I'll, uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again, thank God for Judicial Watch, that we are able, and thank God for America still, that we're still able to do this work here to uncover this sort of government misconduct and abuse. Because if we didn't do it, I don't think it'd be, we didn't know anything about issues like this. And I encourage you to 
you know, you know, I talked about a lot of cases today and a lot of issues. I encourage you to go to our website, find out what we're up to, look at these documents and court cases and documents and share the wealth, share the wealth of education and information about what your government's up to. And if you like what we're doing, I encourage you to support our work. If you've already supported our work, thank you. And of course, we can always use additional support. And with that, God bless you and God bless America. And I'll see you here next time on the Judicial Watch Weekly Update. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and like our video down below.